thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, Alan. Um, I would, in particularly, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, Gardner Organization. I think the Gardner uh, Award in Global Public Health has now probably become the premier award in global health. Uh, and I think it is a real testimony that King is its most re recent recipient. So I s think that speaks uh, really volumes to the uh, professionalism of the Gardner Foundation, the status it's achieved at the international level, as well as the great honor that uh, the five recipients has received. So today, today I'm going to speak about uh, chlamydia control and why I believe despite the current program we have in public health for the control of chlamydia infection, a vaccine will pro be proven to be essential. So first off, uh, I'm going to do this talk in two portions. Uh, one is going to be around the theme of program science. I was interested to learn what program science was and I wrote to Jamie Blanchard specifically about this. Normally we think of the uh, uh, twin solitudes of uh, research and its application in medicine or uh, public health to a translational problem of moving that knowledge from its discovery to its application. Program science is really a kind of interesting way of looking at programs uh, with in infection biology and animal model systems that early antimicrobial treatment of a bacterial infection such as Listeria or Salmonella attenuates the development of protective immunity. So uh, with that uh, concept in mind, uh, what do we understand about uh, the epidemiology of chlamydia in the era of control? And in British Columbia, we've had a chlamydia control program in place since uh, the early, 19, uh, uh, early 1990s. It's interesting that chlamydia still is the most common reported communicable disease in our province by far. In 2011, there were near 12,000 cases reported that year in the province. And these are the examples of the top 10, four of which are sexually transmitted infections. This is an example of um, chlamydia case rates in BC compared to the rest of Canada between 1991 and 2003. Uh, following the launch of the chlamydia program, it was rolled out in segments over about a 10 year period and shown there are the major signposts of uh, portions that were added to the chlamydia control program. And case rates, as you would like to see when you launch a control program, for about the first half of the uh, era of control declined until around 1996 when they increased. In blue is shown the BC rates. You can see a little dip in 2001 uh, off of the rather stable uh, U-shaped curve that we're observing there. In that year, we had offered mass uh, prophylaxis for a syphilis outbreak in the urban area of uh, uh, Vancouver. And it was interesting to see that was the only year in which we saw a deviation from the pattern of chlamydia, uh, increasing chlamydia case rates in the recent uh, past. Coincidence with this rising case rate was a rising reinfection rate. Uh, and this was uh, absolutely astounding to me when I first observed this data. Right now, about 15% uh, of all chlamydia infections that are identified in the province are among individuals who are infected in the previous 12 months. So a large burden of uh, chlamydia uh, cases are occurring in previously infected individuals who are infected relatively recently. We did a model on uh, what were the predictors of chlamydia uh, uh, reinfection risks and shown in the left hand figure are the rising rates uh, over the course of this observation. It's about four and a half percent per year over the period of uh, the control program. These rates were higher in girls than they were in boys, and they were highest in 
youngest individuals as compared to older individuals. So girls are the, in the right-hand panel, are the red curve and boys are the blue curve. So another element of this to understand with chlamydia is that the immune system is involved in chlamydia biology not only in producing uh, immunity to the pathogen, but in uh, creating the inflammatory environment that produces the major public health sequelae of infection. It's a disease of immunopathology. <clears throat> and shown here is the Roman god uh, Janus. Uh, Rome is built on seven hills, but there is an eighth hill in Rome that's given over to this god who stands and looks out with the same head to see who's coming into Rome and who's leaving Rome. And in that sense, uh, chlamydia immunobiology is much like that. It has these two faces. So knowing that, what would you expect to see in the pelvic inflammatory disease rates? These are critical. Uh, chlamydia PID is thought to be a disease of immunopathology. And so strikingly, shown in the black are the chlamydia case rates. In the red are the pelvic inflammatory disease rates. And in the dotted line are ectopic pregnancy rates. So these two immunopathological sequelae of chlamydia infection have declined over this period of observation. In fact, the decline in PID is totally remarkable. We normally would estimate that maybe 30% of pelvic inflammatory disease is caused by chlamydia. These kind of observations would suggest that more on the order of 80% of pelvic inflammatory disease has some component of its causation linked to chlamydia infection. So here we have a situation where interrupting the evolving immune response can interfere with the acquisition of immunity, but it is also beneficial because it attenuates the harmful immune response that occurs as a result of infection. So clearly carrying forward with our current program is a good thing to do because it is preventing pelvic inflammatory disease, but it's a very complex picture. And it's for that reason that uh, better control for chlamydia is likely going to involve the development of a vaccine. And uh, developing a chlamydia vaccine is not a high priority in the public or in the private sector. So it's going to require some novel thinking about how to mobilize the strengths of the private sector, big pharma, together with public health and the academic sector to, uh, to really move a vaccine uh, uh, forward. Uh, for clinical trial purposes. And probably two of the most important notions are that there needs to be a strong pull mechanism. And that requires that public health uh, identify that the development of a chlamydia vaccine is an essential priority. And I think some of the data I've shown you today uh, supports that. The second is there needs to be a strong push mechanism and that's probably best done through uh, uh, collaborative efforts that involve public-private partnerships. Sitting above that infertility belt in Africa is the meningitis belt. And it was through a public-private partnership that the glycoconjugate vaccine for group A meningococci was developed. I suspect that if we were able to pull together the same coalition, we could really advance the cause of the chlamydia vaccine. So developing these push mechanisms and pull mechanisms are going to be essential in uh, uh, elevating uh, the feasibility of developing a chlamydia vaccine. So what, how, how biologically feasible is developing a chlamydia vaccine? I think the epidemiological evidence suggests there's a lot more immunity going on than we recognized previously. So the, probably the natural infection uh, contributes some level of immunity. A vaccine is going to have to achieve and exceed that in order for it to be fully effective from a public health point of view. This is an intracellular bacterial pathogen. We have excellent uh, mouse models of chlamydia infection, either involving a mouse strain of chlamydia called chlamydium uroderum, 
which when delivered in the vagina produces a disease very similar to what's seen in infected humans, infecting the cervix and spreading to the upper genital tract. Human strains of chlamydia can infect the most genital tract if they're directly inoculated into the uterus where they are able to uh, infect the endometrium and spread to the fallopian tubes. In the mouse system, there are strong surrogates of immunity. These include multifunctional T cells, especially CD4 T cells that secrete interferon gamma and TNF alpha. An antibody appears to play a role, but only when there are uh, T cell responses simultaneously occurring. So knowing that CD4 T cells are the effector cells involved in chlamydia immunity, how are we going to identify which chlamydia proteins are stimulating those T cells? Well, we're fortunate in knowing that the MHC class II molecule presents peptides from chlamydia proteins that are capable of stimulating CD4 T cells. And by taking antigen presenting cells infected with chlamydia and uh, identifying the, the peptides that are bound to class II molecules, you can actually identify the source proteins that, uh, that generated those peptides and get a handle on which proteins in this organism might be useful in a T cell uh, vaccine approach. Uh, there are about a thousand proteins encoded by the genome of chlamydia. And in such studies, uh, 27 proteins were identified to generate 78 uh, class II binding peptides. Uh, five surface proteins uh, were particularly strongly dominant as T cell antigens, and when they were mixed with a uh, uh, adjuvant system composed of liposomes and a TLL4 agonist called MPL, they were able to stimulate this highly polarized CD4 T cell response. And this kind of vaccine formulation using five chlamydia membrane proteins together with this uh, vaccine delivery system was tested in mice. And shown in the middle uh, uh, bar are the results of this vaccine in reducing the shedding of chlamydia in three different inbred strains of mice and in all three strains of mice, it did attenuate uh, shedding of the organism, suggesting that they will be promising leads uh, for further study. A second approach, and one that was totally unexpected, is that the entire uh, virulence property of chlamydia as a pathogen is controlled by a plasmid. This plasmid en encodes uh, proteins which bind to sites on the chromosome of the bacterium which produce the actual virulence products themselves. When chlamydia uh, is selected to lack this plasmid, it's entirely attenuated. And so it becomes possible to develop a plasmid depleted strain as a living attenuated vaccine for chlamydia. And shown here on the right-hand panel are six primates who had been immunized with this live uh, chlamydia attenuated vaccine compared to six primates that uh, were not immunized. Uh, these primates were challenged in the eye and the clinical scores to infection were determined and the, and the shedding of the organism was measured. And overall, this vaccine produced highly effective uh, uh, attenuation of a chlamydia infection in the monkey eye. And again, this kind of vaccine is probably a very strong candidate uh, for evaluation in chlamydia uh, immunology, uh, vaccinology. So we have at least two good approaches uh, to chlamydia vaccine development, which are capable of entering late preclinical phase evaluation and ultimately uh, uh, early phase human trials. So overall, uh, I think chlamydia it remains a global health problem. The seek and treat pro programs are expensive. They have very limited accessibility and they perturb herd immunity. And early vaccine solutions are in the offering, but they're going to require this uh, coordinated coalition in order to advance 
uh, their introduction into public health evaluation. Thank you. Science as your lens to really get new science out of the program itself, sort of an experiment of nature. And so I'll be illustrating the problem with chlamydia through a program science approach. The second portion of the talk will be more of a basic science approach, where are we at with respect to the possibility of uh, developing a chlamydia vaccine. There will be uh, uh, the general overview of the talk is that there, I'll talk about chlamydia as a global public health problem. I'll uh, present information on how we've evaluated the British Columbia Chlamydia Control Program, and, uh, and then I will uh, leave you with emerging insights with respect to uh, chlamydia vaccine. Before I launch into this, I want to make a, a point about how much we currently spend to control chlamydia in the province of British Columbia. We have about 12,000 infections annually, uh, about 3% of chlamydia tests are positive for chlamydia, which means we're doing around 350,000 chlamydia tests a year. Each test costs around $25. We're spending somewhere between seven and $10 million a year in a province of four million people to control chlamydia. This is almost twice the budget that we would spend on our most expensive vaccine, HPV. So clearly there, we, there's a great opportunity cost by the current strategy uh, with respect to chlamydia control. And of course, this strategy that we currently apply is only uh, doable in a developed country setting. So there's a lot of room to uh, make improvements in chlamydia control. So uh, sexually transmitted diseases in global public health uh, STIs obviously have a profound impact on sexual, reproductive, and maternal child infant health. They're a core component of the WHO's global strategy on reproductive health. And STI control will be essential to achieving the Millennium Development Goals in at least three areas. Uh, goal four around improving child health, uh, goal five around improving maternal health, and goal six on HIV prevention. And despite these uh, um, uh, challenges, SDI control itself remains incomplete and a very challenging problem. Uh, one way of classifying STIs are into those which are curable or treatable with antimicrobial therapy and uh, those which are not. Among the curable STIs are chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and trichomoniasis. And it's, uh, the WHO has done estimates of the global burden of infection with each of these pathogens. And annually, it estimates that there are about 106 million incident cases of chlamydia. Interestingly, that, that's about the prevalence of infection, too, on a global basis. A similar proportion of uh, gonorrhea, its incidence is, uh, it, its prevalence is about half of the its incidence, syphilis about 11 million cases, and trichomoniasis 276 million cases. And it's interesting to compare the previous estimate done in 2005 to that uh, done in 2008, where the, uh, there was a slight increase in STI. So despite the syndromic approach to managing these conditions, at least for these pathogens, they have not declined in incidence. Chlamydia and gonorrhea are important public health problems because uh, in women, they ascend to cause pelvic inflammatory disease. And pelvic inflammatory disease itself is an important uh, intermediate step uh, for infertility, ectopic pregnancy, and chronic pelvic pain. As a component of pathogenesis, the reason these two pathogens do this is they selectively destroy the ciliated epithelial cells in the fallopian tubes. These are cells which are involved in sweeping the egg from the ovary, the released egg from the ovary down the fallopian tubes uh, for fertilization and ultimately implantation into the endometrium. And so the loss of those uh, epithelial cells, ciliated epithelial cells, has this selective effect on ovum transport, producing either infertility or ectopic pregnancy. 
One indication of the burden of disease through pelvic inflammatory disease that these two pathogens produce on a global basis is found in Africa. This was a study reported in 1976 from an epidemiologist at the WHO, uh, Mark Belsey, who uh, uh, collected vital statistics data from uh, a number of countries in sub-Saharan Africa and showed that there is a distinct infertility belt which really runs across the waste of Africa. In some countries, uh, such as the Cameroons, a woman could reach the age of 49, about a third of women reaching the age of 49 would never have had a living child. Uh, these uh, figures uh, are uh, as you move out from this infertility belt, decline, but there's still a very significant fraction of infertility generally throughout this area. And the background rate of infertility in Africa generally should be less than 5%. So clearly, uh, infertility in this mid portion of Africa is an extremely important uh, social phenomenon. Several epidemiological and clinical studies uh, demonstrate that most of this infertility is related to uh, uh, pelvic inflammatory disease and uh, tubal damage due to previous infection with chlamydia and gonococci. Of course, we have uh, gonococcal treatment uh, that's more available now than it was in the 1970s, but chlamydia essentially remain, remains an unidentified, untreated pathogen in this area, and I expect that if similar vital statistics studies were done were done, we would still find this large infertility belt in sub-Saharan Africa. So what do we do about uh, STI control? It's, uh, this is sort of um, public health 101. Uh, STI control is really a, a kind of inter, uh, integration of preventions at the primary level, secondary level, and tertiary level. Primary prevention uh, involves behavioral and biological approaches to uh, disease control. In the case of STIs, this involves messages around uh, safe sexual behaviors and vaccines where they are available. It's interesting, most uh, uh, people who analyze the effectiveness of behavioral interventions to modify uh, risk behaviors for sexually transmitted disease do not demonstrate a large or sustained effect on attenuating uh, risk. Uh, so this is somewhat different than King's interpretation of the data, that uh, uh, there has been uh, beneficial effects produced uh, through behavioral messages regarding uh, uh, safe sexual practices. Secondary prevention, especially for the curable STIs, is the primary uh, modality. In much of the developing world, this is done through syndromic uh, approaches, meaning you don't use diagnostic tests. You identify the likely pathogens for a clinical syndrome and offer uh, antimicrobial therapy uh, for those pathogens. In much of the developed uh, world, this is done through screening programs uh, and case finding, and then the use of a treatment, seek and treat. This uh, <coughs> screening step is what is proving so costly in, in terms of the economics of STI control. Uh, economics of STI control. And then finally, the uh, tertiary services for STI control really involve uh, uh, things like in vitro fertilization and uh, identification and treatment of ectopic pregnancy with drugs like methotrexate. It's interesting, the only Nobel Prize that has been awarded for uh, STI control in some general way is in vitro fertilization. So it's interesting how our top prizes really have motivate, motivated the application of, the best, of our best scientists to a specific aspect uh, of this problem. The epidemic, uh, epidemiological principles of the treatment of uh, curable uh, STIs is really based on this course concept of identifying an infected individual so that you shorten their average duration of infection. This is meant to prevent disease pathogenesis, obviously, the individual level benefit, but it is also meant to shorten uh, transmission to exposed sexual partners. And for most of these pathogens, uh, 
which produce long, longer duration infections in hosts, there is a trade-off between the time the pathogen has to be in the body to generate an immune response versus the offering of antimicrobial therapy early to uh, eliminate the pathogen. So there's a kind of directionality that the longer you have the pathogen, the more likely you are to acquire an immune response to it. And the shorter uh, time that you have the pathogen, the less likely you are. So there's a trade-off between immunity and interrupting transmission. And this proves to be, I think, particularly important for chlamydia. Uh, to illustrate this fact uh, that uh, uh, longer duration infections probably contribute to the development of uh, immunity protection from reinfection is this very interesting study uh, published this, earlier this year in the Journal of Infectious Diseases by Will Geisler. He uh, reported a study where about 200 women were identified to have chlamydia through a screening program at an STI clinic. These women were called back and two to seven weeks later came into the clinic to, to be treated for their chlamydia infection. Between that screening visit and their enrollment visit, 44 women had spontaneously cleared infection and 156 uh, remained persistently infected. All 200 women were offered therapy and they were seen in follow-up for the subsequent six months. Of those individuals who had spontaneously cleared infection, only 4.5% were reinfected during that post-treatment observation period, whereas those who had a persistent infection, 16.5% acquired a reinfection during the following six months of, of observation. This is uh, interesting data which does indicate that women who had spontaneously cleared their infection may have developed an immune response which conferred resistance to reinfection should exposure occur. And that individuals who had, were persistently infected did not yet uh, imprint their immune system to develop this protective immune response. Do antibiotics interfere with the development of uh, immune responses to a pathogen such as chlamydia? This is actually the very first study that I became involved with when I was a fellow with King in 1981. We published this in uh, Infection and Immunity. This was a group of men who had non-gonococcal urethritis, uh, seven of, of whom had chlamydia as their cause and 13 who did not. All uh, 20 men were treated with tetracycline and uh, were seen three to four weeks later and their cellular immune responses at baseline uh, were compared at the initial visit and the follow-up visit and it was interesting that the cellular immune responses were specifically suppressed in those who had received antimicrobial therapy. This, this might be in this kind of setting equivalent to what we were observing in Will Geisler's study among women who were persistently infected with chlamydia. This is a well-known phenomenon uh, 